welcome back to ELA Grade 6 for the week of May 25th, 2020. In this lesson, we will read an article, an informational text, to determine how central ideas are conveyed through the details in the text. Think about it before we start to read. What can one person achieve by speaking out about a problem? And what risks do they take by speaking out? We will be reading parts of an article about Malala Yousafzai, and she took a lot of risk for speaking out about something she thought was important. As a young woman, she was attacked for speaking out in favor of education for all people. Here is a well-known quote of Malala's. One child, one teacher, one book, and one pen can change the world. As we read, we will consider the questions in this chart, known as the five W's in an H. This is in the try it section of your packet. Keep these questions in mind as we read about Malala. We will be looking for the who, the what, when, where, why, and how that goes on in this section. Pay attention to the details in the article that contribute to your understanding of the text. These details help to determine the central idea. The central idea is what the text is about. The details the author provides support this idea. We will not be reading the entire article. You have the full article in your packet that you will be able to read on your own. I will read parts of the article aloud and model how to complete the chart. You will need to read the entire article afterwards on your own and add additional details to your chart. Remember that we are trying to answer the questions in your chart. Let's get started. Malala's Fight for Education by Manuela Escobar. Here's a little background. In many countries, gender does not influence whether someone has access to an education. However, in some parts of the world, boys have access to education, but women do not. This injustice has gained attention, thanks in part to the efforts of a young Pakistani woman who has turned a personal tragedy into tri a triumph. Malala was born on July 12, 1997, in Mangora, a big city in Pakistan. Malala's father is an advocate for education in Pakistan and runs a group of private schools. Malala attended one of these schools. During her elementary school years, the Taliban, an Islamic religious group, were wreaking havoc, attacking schools throughout Pakistan. They believed girls and women should be kept apart from boys and men and should not have access to an education. So in this first paragraph, we find out more than just Malala's name. We find out about where she's from, a little bit about her family and background, and that even as a girl, she did attend school. When she was 12 years old, Malala gave a speech to Pakistani journalists and leaders in response to the Taliban. It was titled, How Dare the Taliban Take Away My Basic Right to Education? It became widely known because of all the media members present in the audience. She knew that her actions might put her in danger of a Taliban attack, since they use violence to silence opponents. So she was taking risks here. In October 2012, the danger became a reality. Malala was riding the bus home from school when a man boarded, armed with a gun. He asked which of the passengers was Malala. When some girls looked her way, he found his target. He shot her in the head, and two other students were also injured. Malala was transported to a military hospital in Peshawar. There, doctors were able to remove the bullet and save her life. Days later, Malala was moved to a hospital in England, where she recovered for three months before returning home. So this is a lot of the what. Leaders around the world condemned the Taliban's actions. Despite the fact that the Taliban still viewed her as a threat, Malala did not stop speaking out in favor of women's education. 
On her 16th birthday, less than a year after the attack, Malala spoke at the United Nations headquarters in New York. The United Nations is an organization that promotes international cooperation. Speaking for all boys and girls, Malala said, we want schools and education for every child's bright future. We will continue our journey to our destination of peace and education. No one can stop us. Malala has continued to spread her message since then. She has spoken from Harvard University to Buckingham Palace, the Queen of England's residence, meeting with world leaders from many countries. In October 2013, the European Parliament awarded her the prestigious Sakharov Prize for Freedom of Thought. That same year, she was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, an award previously won by individuals such as Mother Teresa, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and President Barack Obama. Though she did not win that year, she did take home the prize in 2014, becoming the youngest person to ever receive the Nobel Peace Prize. Much of the progress in her fight has come thanks to the activity of the foundation that bears her name. The Malala Fund is a nonprofit foundation that aims to improve education for girls in areas torn apart by violence, warfare, and poverty. In July 2015, Malala used the fund to open a girls' school in Lebanon for Syrian refugees who would not have had access to schooling without the fund's work. The school stands out as a landmark in Malala's flourishing service career. She is working hard, building toward the better future she has always imagined. Now we will take a look, go back to the chart and complete it. As you can see, I've completed it for you and I'm hoping that you will add additional details as you read the, the article in entirety. So follow along and add additional notes or write notes on a piece of paper. Answering all the questions ensures that we, the readers, understand everything about the story. We will use evidence from the text to answer the first questions. Then you will complete the chart on your own, adding more details. So first of all, who is the article about? That's the easy question. We knew that right from the start, who we were going to be reading about, Malala. But who really was she? These are the details that are going to help us get to the central idea of the article and what the author is really wanting us to know. So she is a young girl from Pakistan. Her father is an advocate for education. She attended one of her father's schools. Malala also advocates for education and she is known around the world for her work. So that tells a lot about who she is, not just her name. What happened to this person? Malala was shot in the head by the Taliban. She was sent to a hospital in England, and it took three months for her to recover and return home. And yet, she spoke less than a year later at the United, State, United Nations headquarters in New York City. And she was the youngest person to win the Nobel Peace Prize. So all these details contribute to what happened. To her. When did it happen? We know it happened in October of 2012. So that's the date it happened. But we also need to know what was going on when it happened. It happened when the Taliban was attacking schools for educating girls. So that's an additional detail. Where did it happen? That's very specific, a very large city in Pakistan. And we know that it was a very dangerous city and country and that Malala was riding home on a school bus. Why did it happen? So here are some very important details. The Taliban did not believe girls should be educated. So that's why all this came about. At 11 years old, Malala gave a speech to Pakistani journalists in response to the Taliban. And the title of the speech, How Dare the Taliban Take Away My Basic Right to Education. And if you read on in the article, you will find that she also wrote a blog telling the world what was happening in her country, which put her at even more danger. How did it happen? 
Well, there are lots of things that did happen, but basically an armed man boarded the bus that Malala was riding on. She was his target. When two others turned toward her, he spotted her and shot her. However, just because all this happened, it certainly did not deter her efforts. Now turn to the show what you know in your packet. As you complete your chart and respond in the show what you know, consider are some of our pre-reading questions, not just the questions in the chart. Remember the very beginning? What can one person achieve by speaking out about a problem? And what risk do they take by speaking out? And what more has been Malala been able to do as a result of her actions? Was it worth it? So now I need you to please go back, read the entire article, return to your chart, and add some more details. So these are just a few that I've included in the one I've completed. And that's it for this time. Next week, you will be reviewing what you've read in this unit. Until then, have a wonderful week. Be safe and be well, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Hello, and welcome back to ELA Grade 6 GT for the week of May 25th, 2020. Today, we will be reading excerpts from two of Shakespeare's plays in which a character commits murder. We will read closely to analyze exactly what is happening in the characters' heads when they decide to commit murder. We will analyze the impact of the word choices on the meaning and tone. So we'll look at two plays and two murders. Shakespeare wrote different types of plays, comedies, tragedies, and histories. In his tragedies and histories, there are some murders. Sometimes the murderers are villains. Sometimes the murderer is the protagonist of the play. Our first excerpt is from Macbeth. Macbeth, the play, is considered a tragedy. The title character and protagonist of Macbeth was a Scottish lord who encountered three witches in a wood. They prophesied that Macbeth would be Thane of Cawdor. A Thane means a man at that time held land, which was very important and usually appointed by the king. So they prophesied that he would be Thane of Cawdor, and then King of Scotland. Soon after, Macbeth is named Thane of Cawdor. With his wife whispering in his ear, he begins to think that the prophecy is true. When King Duncan, Macbeth's cousin, and the King of Scotland come to stay with Macbeth, Macbeth and his wife see an opportunity to make the prophecy come true. By killing Duncan, Macbeth overcomes his qualms and stabs Duncan in his sleep. Hmm, not very nice. Our second excerpt is from the play Julius Caesar. It is considered a history and a tragedy. In Julius Caesar, Brutus was Julius Caesar's best friend. The only thing Brutus loved more was Rome. When it seems like Caesar will attempt a crown from the people and become king and a tyrant, assassins decide to kill him. They recruit Brutus. Brutus loves Caesar, but he loves Rome more. Who knows how bad Caesar might become if he were the king? Brutus ends up stabbing Caesar in the back, literally, on the floor of the Roman Senate. Both Macbeth and Brutus murder a man they do not hate. What is going on in their heads? Next, we will read their monologues closely to find out, decide which murderer was the most foul, Macbeth's murder of his cousin and house guest, or Brutus's murder of his best friend on a public stage. When we do a close read of a piece of text, we are looking deeply into its meaning. 
which requires more than reading the text once. First, we will read each monologue once to hear the language and determine the overall meaning. Second, we will read the monologues again and annotate words and phrases that reveal the character's emotions. What tone do the words and phrases create? Angry, sad, vengeful, undecided? Annotate by highlighting or taking notes in the margins. Third, we will use the questions on the right that you'll see in just a moment to read the monologues a last time closely and see how the word choices you identified impact the meaning and tone. So please follow along while I read. And if you have your packet, it'd be a good idea to pull it out now so that you can mark it up. You may find some more ideas than I do because I'm gonna to have to go through this rather quickly due to our time constraints here. So please, whatever you see, that I don't mention, make sure you highlight it or make a note of it. So follow along while I read aloud. From Macbeth. He's here in double trust. First, as I am his kinsman and his subject. Strong both against the deed. Then, as his host, who should against his murderer shut the door? Not bear the knife myself. Besides, this Duncan hath borne his faculties so meek, hath been so clear in his great office, that his virtues will plead like angels, trumpet-tongued against the deep damnation of his taking off. And pity, like a naked, newborn babe, striding the blast or heaven's cherubim, forced upon the sightless couriers of the air, shall blow the horrid deed in every eye, that tears shall drown the wind, I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition, which o'erleaps itself and falls on the other. So that's our first read. It kind of just gives us the gist of what's going on. Now we're going to take a look at, at this piece of text for words and phrases that reveal the character's emotions. And we're going to highlight what we find. Again, I encourage you to follow along and to highlight additional pieces that I may have missed or skipped over, as I said, because we have to move quickly. So here we go. He's here in double trust. So Macbeth is thinking, hmm, you know, he's pretty going to be calm about this. Double trust means that Duncan thinks of him as his cousin, his kinsman, and his subject. Okay. Oh, strong against the deed. In other words, who is going to kill their cousin and loyal subject? Then, as his host, who should against his murderer shut the door? Not bear the knife myself. So he's thinking, oh my goodness, Duncan will never think that I would do this. I'm going to highlight that piece, not bear the knife myself. Besides, this Duncan hath borne his faculties so meek, hath been so clear in his great office, that his virtues will plead like angels, trumpet-tongued against the deep damnation of his taking off. So there's that term, trumpet-tongued, against the deep damnation of his taking off. So those words are telling me that, including some of these, that Duncan must have been a really good king. And... His virtues will speak for him. So when we talk trumpet tongue, we sometimes think of angels with trumpets um, going against his taking off, which means his death. And pity, like a naked newborn babe striding the blast or heaven's cherubim, horsed upon the sightless couriers of the air, shall blow the horrid deed in every eye. So he's realizing how horrible this murder is going to be that tears shall drown the wind. I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition, which o'erleaps itself and falls on the other. So he really has no reason other than his vaulting ambition, which overcomes, or as it says here, or leaps itself and falls on the other. Wow. So we have a good idea of what's going on in Macbeth's head. Let's take a look at a couple of these questions. 
So what are two reasons Duncan should be able to trust Macbeth not to kill him? And we pointed that out a little bit as we highlighted that he, Duncan, is there in double trust. He's visiting his kinsman, his cousin, and his subject. So those would be two reasons that Duncan would trust Macbeth. How will others take Duncan's death? Is he a loved or hated leader? So we have a lot of information here that he was a great office and that his virtues I mean he did a lot with very good qualities. will plead like angels against the deep damnation of his taking off. And shall blow the horrid deed in every eye that tears shall drown the wind. I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition, which o'erleaps itself and falls on the other. So others are going to be very upset um, about Duncan's death. So he was a very much liked leader. And where it says, the tears shall drown the wind, people are really going to be sad and crying. And what's the only thing, the reason that Macbeth has to kill Duncan? His ambition to be king. Let's check our work. So I think we are pretty close here. Macbeth is his kinsman or relative and subject. Duncan rules over Macbeth and everyone will be devastated about Duncan's death. He was a beloved leader because he was meek, clear and virtuous. His goodness will plead like angels, trumpet tongued. People will feel pity about the horrid dead and will cry so hard their tears shall drown the wind. And his vaulting ambition. The only reason he's going to kill Duncan is that he wants to be king. The second monologue we read is Brutus from Julius Caesar. We will follow the same steps we did when we did a close read of Macbeth's monologue. So we're going to read through quickly for just a general idea of what the text is saying. Brutus, and for my part, I know no personal cause to spurn at him, but for the general. He would be crowned. How that might change his nature, there's the question. Is it the bright day that brings forth the adder, adder equals snake, and that craves weary walking? Crown him, that, and then I grant we put a sting in him, that at his will he may do danger with. The abuse of greatness is, when it disjoins remorse from power and to speak truth of caesar i have not known when his affection swayed more than his reason but tis a common proof that lowliness is young ambition's ladder whereto the climber upward turns his face but when he attains the utmost round he then unto the ladder turns his back looks in the clouds scorning the base degrees by which he did ascend and so may Caesar. All right, so we have a general idea here about what's going on in Brutus's mind. So let's go back for a second read and look for some of those words and phrases that let us know some of his emotions. Again, please follow along and add to your notes if I miss anything that you seem to pick up. So, and for my part, I know no personal cause to spurn him. So there's no, he has no personal reason to kill him. So that is probably, I would think that would be bothering him a little bit. He would be crowned. How that might change his nature, that's the question. So he's worried here, okay? He might, that might change his nature. It is the bright day that brings forth the adder or the snake. So it's the good day, okay? It's a bright day but then it's going to bring forth something evil like a snake. And that craves wary walking. Crown him, that, and then, I grant, we put a sting in him. So here he's feeling we're going to change him. We're going to put a sting in him that at his will he may do danger with. So once he becomes king, he can do what he wants at his will, and he could do some dangerous things. The abuse of greatness is, when it disjoins remorse from power, and to speak truth of Caesar, 
I have not known when his affection swayed more than his reason. So here he's making a little pause and telling the truth about Caesar, that he is known when his, he has not known when his affections have swayed more than his reason. So his affections, as far as Brutus has seen, have never swayed more than his reason. He's always put his reason first. But tis common proof that lowliness is ambitions, young ambitions ladder, whereto the climber upward turns his face. But once he attains the utmost round, he then unto the ladder turns his back. Uh-oh, so he's made going up to the top, and now he's going to turn his back on everything. Looks into the clouds, scorning the base degrees by which he did ascend. So Caesar may. So scorning the base degrees, all the people that may have helped him get to the top, he may turn his back on them. So let's do a quick look through, through these questions. Does Brutus have any personal reason to hate Caesar? No, we said right here, no personal cause to spurn at him. What does Brutus worry a crown would do to Caesar? Well, we're saying that it could put a sting in him and make him do dangerous things to the people. He can do whatever he wants if he's king. Has Brutus ever known Caesar to let power go to his head? No, he says here, to speak truth of Caesar, I have not known when his affection swayed more than his reasons. And what is Brutus afraid Caesar will do after he attains his utmost round? He will turn his back on everyone who's helped him get that far. So let's check our work. So we were right. He knows no personal cause to spurn him. He worries that a crown would change his nature, change his personality. It could put a sting in him that at his will he may do danger with. He may abuse his power if he doesn't feel remorse. He has not known his affections swayed more than his reasons. He has always acted reasonably and not let his emotions sway him. But Brutus is worried that Caesar will turn his back, look in the clouds, scorning the base degrees. He may forget all of the little people, the people who helped him gain power, and only focus on the heights he has attained and how he can gain more power and rise higher. Now you have a really good understanding of the thoughts of both men as they contemplated murder. Consider which murderer was the most foul or the worst. Turn to the show what you know in your packet and you will pick one monologue and then pick one way to represent your analysis. You have three ways provided in your packet to do this. So have fun and this is your independent work. Next week, more Shakespeare. We will read and analyze a monologue this time from The Taming of the Shrew, but I promise you the Taming of the Shrew is much lighter than the monologues that we read today. And until then, be safe, be well, and have a great week. Goodbye.